Adam, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation with me. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Yeah, yeah. So my name is Adam Lloyd Johnson. I've been using my middle name more and more because I'm I'm finding out there's a lot of Adam Johnsons in the world. And uh, the most famous one is a professional soccer player in England. But unfortunately, he's currently serving prison time for having a relationship with a minor. Ooh. So the last thing I need is people to search for Adam Johnson and see Adam Johnson currently in jail for so yeah, my middle name is Lloyd. Just think of uh, Dumb and Dumber, Lloyd, probably the most famous Lloyd. But that's that's me, Adam Lloyd Johnson. Cool. So uh, I am an atheist, by which I mean I believe that all of the evidence that we see in the natural world is best explained by some kind of a natural force or something. Why would you prioritize a God explanation for anything, essentially? What, what, what arguments or evidence do you think do indicate a God? Yeah. Yeah. Well, like we talked before, when I first engage um, people in these sort of conversations, what I find uh, to be the best thing is to get to know one another as persons, because I'm very um, committed to the idea that we can have these conversations in a friendly way. Unfortunately, I mean, it's kind of a, a trope, right? They don't talk about religion or politics at a dinner party because um, they usually get feisty. And I just don't think they have to. So one of the ways that I've found that helps folks um, stay calm and rational and just have a good conversation is to think of the other person uh, as a person and not as a, a combative uh, enemy that they're trying to defeat. So one way I think that helps is to uh, learn more about the person as a person and their journey. And, and so if it's OK, I'd love to just kind of share with you where I've come from and how I've arrived at this point. Sure. Yeah, it shouldn't take too long. But so I grew up here in uh, rural Nebraska and my experience just growing up was most everybody I was around in this rural community believed in God, um, though nobody ever seemed to talk about him. But as I got older and you know moved on to university, I went to the University of Nebraska uh, I wondered if it was one of those situations where it was just us rural farm folks who believed in God, and I would encounter the most educated folks, the professors, to all be um, atheists. And I did. I did have you know several professors who were atheists, but I also had professors who were theists. So two of them that really stood out to me was, were Dr. Martin Gaskell. He was my astronomy professor. And pretty high up in the field of astronomy, he served at the time, this is back in the 90s, but he served on the committee which um, decided where to point the Hubble Space Telescope. But yeah, so he was a theist. And then my philosophy professor, who is a world famous uh, philosophy professor, he's at Notre Dame now, but he's been the president of the American Philosophical Association and the Society of Christian Philosophers, Robert Audie. He's done a lot of work in epistemology and, and, and moral intuitionism. So he was my uh, philosophy professor at university. And so, you know, coming from this rural background, going to university, I studied finance, uh, mathematics, actuarial science. I worked as an actuary for 10 years after college, um, which it's called actuarial science, but it's, it's actually more mathematics. So I was intrigued, you know, this rural farm kid um, to encounter very educated folks, some who believe in God, some who didn't. And I know it's not wise to believe something just because some educated people believe it. So I wanted to dig down deeper and understand why uh, some educated people believe in God, why some educated people didn't. And that took me down a path. Again, this is the 90s, so the internet wasn't as robust as it is now. And Unfortunately, at first, all I could really find was popular level stuff, uh, mostly what's on the Internet nowadays. And it was garbage. You know, a lot of it, as you know, is uh, ad hominem theists and atheists just making fun of each other, just attacking each other, not really listening or having good conversations, just um, uh, 
uh, more of an us them just fighting environment. But eventually I discovered a community where atheists and theists were working together and having respectful conversations and dealing with dealing with one another's best arguments instead of just making fun of their opponents uh, worst arguments so is that community still around it is and the community that i'm referring to is philosophy of religion so philosophy of religion departments around the world at universities and so I wanted to join that community. Uh, I was working as an actuary. This is closer now to when I'm in my uh, late twenties. And so I've moved, I transitioned from actuarial science when I was just about done with all my actuary exams. Um, I moved, I tried to move into this field of philosophy of religion. And long story short, you know, I worked on my PhD in philosophy of religion, it took me seven years because by that time I was married, four kids, and I uh, could only do it part time. But I was very excited to be a part of that community and study what I thought were the best arguments uh, for and against the existence of God. And I so my academic lineage then, uh, I got my PhD under Greg Welty, and Greg Welty got his PhD under Richard Swinburne at Oxford. Um, one of the most well-known theistic philosophers of religion over the last 20 or 30 years. So that's kind of my academic lineage of where I come from in my thinking. Um, so yeah, it was through that process then as I finally got a chance to really dive into this material and study the best arguments for and against the existence of God. Um, as I worked through those, um, I became convinced that you know, there is a God and learned a lot along the way. But um, yeah, that's kind of my story. And I can I can give you a summary of, of what um, specifically led me to conclude that there is a God. But that's kind of my background story. And I'd love to hear yours. First of all, I want to ask you about your name, though. Is your is your last name really Jump or is that your YouTube name? Yes, unfortunately, it is my actual last name. OK, where does that come from? Or what's the history of uh, no idea. I don't really talk to my parents much. Um, okay. So my story was I was brought up in a Christian household, went to Catholic grade school, Catholic high school, uh, had major depression my entire life hmm. up until very recently and prayed for God to help every day, morning and night. Didn't ever get the help I needed. And so I lost the ability to believe there was an all powerful, all loving being who was there watching over me. Um, and that was, I didn't become an atheist right away. I didn't know what the word meant until years later when I started to get into philosophy, researching philosophy and learning about the four horsemen, Hitchens, Harris, Dawkins, then it got into watching debates online, uh, started to talk to professors, local professors, coffee shops, Recorded the conversations, put them online, got some followers. People sort of send me money, and now I do this full time. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm also able to do this full time now. So I was able to move away from my actuarial science career. I served as a pastor while I was working on my uh, degrees, a Southern Baptist pastor down in South Carolina. But then in 2017, I joined. Um, an organization called Rosho Christi. So I work full time for a, a ministry called Rosho Christi that does this sort of thing uh, at universities across the country. So we specialize in having these conversations, call, uh, call it apologetics, whatever you want to call it, but um, presenting uh, what we think are good reasons and evidence to believe that Christianity is true. And so I get to do this full time at the University of Nebraska, which is where you know I went 25 years ago. And but I also have my own ministry on the side. Um, it's called Convincing Proof. It comes from Acts 1 3, which says that Jesus presented many convincing proofs of his resurrection. So convincingproof.org is my website. And then I serve as an adjunct professor at a couple of different um, schools, one in uh, Kansas City and then in Germany for about five or six years. My wife and I would live a month every year in Germany where I would teach at a, at a seminary there. And, and that was really exciting. That was a lot of fun. I'm mostly German myself. So I felt like it was a neat being 
being part of that um, culture for even if it's just one month a year for five or six years. Cool. Does Ratio Christie ever host like in-person debates with atheists and theists? Because that'd be really cool to do. Yeah, we do. Um, so I organized a debate between William Lane Craig and Eric Wielenberg uh, in 2018 at NC State. Had about 1,200 people show up. It was a huge uh, turnout. And we turned it into a book. Uh, Rutledge picked it up and published it. I was the editor of the book and then authored the first chapter. And then we had, you know, a transcript of the debate between Craig and Wielenberg. This was on morality, metaethics. And then we invited uh, five philosophers, or six, we invited six philosophers, three atheists and three Christians to write additional chapters responding to the debate. And then Craig and Wielenberg wrote concluding chapters responding to all their respondents. And so that was published. And then I've had some debates myself. Um, Wielenberg is probably the atheist that I've engaged with the most. And I brought him here to the University of Nebraska and him and I had a, a smaller debate here at the University of Nebraska. But yeah, we, we try to engage um, respectfully with those we disagree with, whether they be, oh, we're mostly Protestants. So sometimes we'll have debates with uh, Catholic thinkers, um, atheists, of course. Um, Muslims. Cool. Well, if you ever want to invite me, I'd be happy to go to all of those as well. Um, be an awesome events. I do those several times a year, which is pretty cool. What campus are you on? Where do you live? Minnesota, University of Minnesota, right next to the campus, pretty close. Okay. Well, yeah, you're not too far away from Nebraska then. Cool. So what do you think, are there any arguments or evidence that indicate a God? And did those arguments and evidence, were those the things that convinced you to believe in a God? Yeah. So like I said, I grew up in a Christian environment, if you will. Um, but I think like many people do as they grow up, they start to question the things that they've been taught or the things that they've inherited from their culture. And I think that's healthy. I think that's good, whether you grow up in an atheist community or a, a theistic community you want to i, I encourage pe young people to um question and and dig into the reasons and evidence for their beliefs and not just you know blindly pick up just what they've been taught um growing up so yeah when i was finally able to dive into this uh community and study the the arguments for and against the existence of god what impressed me probably the most is, um, and, and I'm going to shift in my terminology here a little bit. I've been using the term God because that's what we're used, used to referring to. It it's, um, goes back to an ancient um, uh, German language, Gudan. Uh, it's, it's an English word. We use the term God generally to refer to like the ultimate thing or the supreme being. Um, but I like sometimes I like to point out to Christians that the word God isn't even found in the Bible. So I, and I think sometimes when we use the word God, there's so much, especially in our American culture, that's packaged into that term. I, I find it better, especially at the beginning of these conversations, to use the term either supreme being or ultimate thing. So I'll, I'll slip into that language now. And um, so what impresses me is... You know, you find these um, theistic thinkers around the world and throughout history, history who independently concluded that there is uh, an ultimate thing. And they use different terms. Obviously, we can talk about, yeah, the term God, the term Allah, uh, Theos, uh, unmoved mover, um, Vishna. I mean, there's all sorts of terms that have been used for this idea of an ultimate thing and different descriptions of what this ultimate thing is like. But there's so many independent thinkers around the world and throughout history who came to this independent conclusion that there must be an ultimate thing. And interestingly to me, they've also concluded that this ultimate thing that they're talking about has, uh, they come to similar conclusions about what this ultimate thing is like. In other words, they seem to come up with this general idea that this ultimate thing must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, 
uh, powerful, the creator of everything, intelligent, personal, the source of morality. That seems to be kind of the general idea that you see popping up among these various thinkers. And I don't think this is a coincidence because I think these various thinkers, and I can give you examples, um, I think they came to this conclusion through a similar thought process as you, as they saw the world, as they thought through things, um, they arrived at these conclusions through a similar thought process. And what I'm talking about, this thought process that I'm describing is the three family of three families of theistic arguments. So first cause type arguments, design type arguments, and uh, moral type arguments. So three families of arguments. And you find these arguments around the world and throughout history. This is a, um, a book I often recommend to folks that documents a lot of this, a lot of these arguments found around the world and throughout history, these three types of families of arguments. And it seems like that those uh, three types of arguments led then these theistic thinkers to this conclusion that there is this sort of ultimate thing um, out there. And, you know, I can give you some examples from like Plato, Aristotle's unmoved mover, but it's not just Western thinkers. You know, there's Eastern thinkers from ancient Hindu philosophers to more recently Gandhi. Um, so it's those sort of arguments the first cause type arguments, design arguments, and moral arguments, which also led me to conclude um, that there is an ultimate thing. Cool. So my interpretation of those is that those are mostly indicative of human psychology and evolution and what it's prioritized our brains to think, but really don't give us any insight into what the ultimate nature of reality is. So for example, um, the type one and type two errors where if you hear a rustle in the bushes and you think it's a lion or a demon or whatever, you run away. And, and if you think it's the wind or you want to use the scientific method and find out what it is or something, you're more likely to be eaten by a lion. And so the kinds of people who would survive would be the ones who had more uh, mystical thinking and thought it was always a mind or always an intention. And because of that, human beings, all of human beings have this tendency to the hyperactive agency detection systems and they'll see agency in everything even when there is none which is why we get all the different kinds of ghosts and spirits and leprechauns and uh, demons and gods and uh, monsters under the bed and imaginary friends and so it seems like using our intuitions to make arguments like that aren't really going to be very good sources of information about what reality is like it's going to more lead to a pattern in human intuitions and the fallacies we have and until we have some kind of methodology to filter out those fallacies and biases and leave only what is rational to believe then that method doesn't seem to be a reliable one and from my perspective to give us any indication of what reality is actually like mm -hmm. yeah um and what you're referring to at least at the beginning there uh, evolutionary debunking arguments, which I think are really fascinating um, evolutionary debunking arguments that, you know, if our beliefs or a category of our beliefs um, were indicative of helping us survive more than they were selected by nature. And so, you know, these evolutionary debunking arguments, and you find these a lot of places, especially in morality, that, oh, our moral beliefs came from evolution. So it kind of explains them away. There, there really isn't any objective moral truth. So they try to explain um, away our moral beliefs by saying they were evolutionarily helpful in our process of survival and reproduction. And that kind of explains away those beliefs. Um, and I think, anyway, I, I probably shouldn't go down the path of evolutionary debunking arguments too, too far, but, I don't find them to be, um, they, they seem a bit ad hominem and they seem a bit um, in explaining more where a belief came from, but not whether or not that belief is, is true, if that makes sense. So it's oh yeah, like, for sure. Um, I just want to clarify. So my argument here is more that not simply that it came from evolution, that doesn't matter. Evolution doesn't prove an idea is true or false either way. 
my argument is more that we know evolution gave us this idea and in many cases this idea is provably false we know for a fact there's no monster under the bread there's no leprechauns or spirits when you touch a ouija board we know for a fact that these intuitive beliefs that humans have about explaining these phenomenon that we just don't initially understand like why does a ouija board move and actually spell out letters when you have a bunch of people holding it um and people say it's a ghost or a spirit or whatever and we can prove scientifically that's not the case we know what caused this it's definitely not that but there is definitively this tendency in humans to label those unknown events as a mind did it and it's false in the vast majority of cases that have anything to do with anything other than humans pretty much uh and so it seems inductively rational to apply the same conclusion to anything regarding aliens or gods or who created the universe that we're using the same intuitive metric uh in this context where it doesn't belong because it's false in pretty much every context that doesn't involve humans and so it's more than just saying that it's from evolution and it has some survivability metric it's more the fact that when we apply these intuitions it gets it wrong the vast majority of the time therefore we would need some more kind of justification in addition to these to make it reasonable to believe it in this case of the creating the universe yeah um i guess my initial thought from from what you're saying is you seem to be describing it as you know especially in the ancient world uh almost like um superstition type very a simplistic way of thinking almost like animism like oh yeah there's some spirits in the trees or almost in a superstitious uh sort of way but what i'm referring to are, are more of the um sophisticated arguments that to me don't have that same sort of superstitious simplicity to them so like um plato's arguments aristotle's arguments for an unmoved mover and those those don't seem to have the same sort of ring to me at least as a superstitious you know rattling leprechaun behind the bush behind in, in or in the bushes it's more of a sophisticated complicated processing trying to process what is the ultimate thing is there an ultimate thing and what is that ultimate thing like and that's kind of how ancient philosophy got started right so the ancient greek philosophers i think they were asking a lot of good questions you know what is the ultimate source of things where does from which does everything else come and some of their initial answers were fairly simplistic right so you got the classic well, just uh, sorry to uh, interrupt but just i'm not sure i see the difference here like because if we take uh a pygmy tribe who hears a rustle in the bushes thinks it's a demon versus newton who says the organization of the rotation of the planets in the solar system is so complicated that only a god could set it up the level of complication there uh, sophistication there doesn't make any difference whatsoever as far as I can tell it's really more when there's something you don't know you don't know the answer to um, our tendency is to think it's a mind regardless of whether it's a simple problem an unsophisticated problem or a very sophisticated problem the same bias in human exists and so I don't see why there would be a difference in the level of sophistication of the initial problem to the fact that our tendency to infer a mind would still be equally as much a bias that we have yeah no i guess i wasn't referring to the sophistication of the problem i guess i was talking more about the sophistication of the arguments so for for instance you know if i've got somebody who you know very animistic superstitious um, and uneducated tribe thousands of years ago who was just running away from every ruffle in the bushes because they think there's you know leprechauns or fairies you know that's one thing to look at that and say well yeah you can kind of see how that might develop via evolution dismiss those kind of silly beliefs but it's another thing when you've got um i would say sophisticated thinkers like Pla plato and aristotle who are putting forth philosophical arguments for an ultimate thing i think it's more difficult to just brush those aside as just superstitious uh biases that they inherited you gotta i think a, a person needs to deal with the arguments uh themselves and not just brush them aside as a you know evolutionary superstitious thing if that makes sense oh absolutely i totally agree i'd say that 
my reason for believing it's evolutionary is because you can take the, ex the exact same arguments and change the noun to a non-mind and you get an equally as compelling set of arguments. And that seems to indicate that it was purely a bias that people prioritize these as indicating a God versus a non-God. And so when I see these arguments, I'm like, well, that doesn't actually work for a God. I don't understand why people think this is evidence. It's like a broken compass that is somebody shakes it and it points north. I'm like, ah, look, this is the true north. And then I'm like, hmm, let me see that and shake it a little bit. Now this is north. Like, should I believe this is north? Um, and so when I hear the theistic arguments, I find them to be uncompelling towards any particular direction and that they can be answered equally as well or better by natural hypotheses than a God hypothesis. And that's why I think this is better explained by human bias. Well, I respect that. And I think that's the best way to uh, argue or, or reason or, or just conceptually think through it is what is the best explanation for the particular evidence that we're seeing. So um, I don't know what your epistemological position is, but I, I lean more towards like a, a John Polkinghorn um, critical realism, where I, I think there is real objective truth out there, but I don't think that we can, as finite creatures, can come to uh, an absolute um, certainty in our knowledge. And so we were kind of stuck with um, looking at the, the, the evidence and the reasons and making conclusions without absolute certainty. So there's always an, uh, an, a gap there in our knowledge. And so as you described, I would as well, um, the conclusion I think we should come to is the, the most reasonable, or sometimes it's referred to as abductive reasoning or inference to the best explanation. So that's what I've done is I've looked at these arguments <laughs> for and against God. But let me go back to, so the ancient Greek philosophers, right? They're positing, or they're trying to figure out, you know, what's the ultimate thing? From which did everything else come? Earth, air, fire, water. Some of them were kind of simplistic. Democritus said um, everything is made up of atoms, which is pretty incredible for him to say that 2,500 years ago, 3,000 years ago. Um, everything's made up of these small, tiny little particles. But I think they were asking the right question, and is that there's got to be an ultimate thing. Um, so let me ask you that. Do you... Do you think it's reason not reasonable? Do you think it's um, the best explanation of reality or, or or being or whatever you want to say? Do you think it's the best explanation that there is some ultimate thing? I'm not calling it God, but that there is just some ultimate thing. Uh, it depends on what you mean by ultimate. Like I think there must be some ultimate uh, material that everything is made of. But if by ultimate you mean a necessary being that created all other things, no. I think that the best current explanation is an infinite regress. Um, I'm happy to grant that there's an, there's a necessary thing. I don't think it would indicate a being, a conscious being of any kind. But to me, the best explanation probably follows from physics. And the best physical explanations we have as infinite regress is the most plausible thing based on the evidence we have. Okay. And... That's exactly where I was going with this. So the, um, that idea of an infinite regress. So I, I didn't quite understand your answer. So you, do you think that there is an infinite regress or do you think that there is an ultimate thing? Uh, I think like, I don't really, for me, I don't have a particular uh, belief either way, but I think that the best evidence indicates an infinite regress. And so that would be the more rational thing to hold. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And I, and maybe this is just going to be, you know, boiled down to intuitions or what we find to be most uh, plausible or most re most reasonable. But um, I've been largely Im impressed and convinced against the arguments for an infinite regress that there can be uh, such a thing as an actual infinite or an infinite regress. So, for instance, I like Aristotle think it's more reasonable that there is a beginning, there is an ultimate, that there that there can't be an infinite regress. So I think it's most reasonable to conclude that there is some sort of ultimate thing uh, at the beginning. So that's that's kind of where I start, that there that there is an ultimate thing. And then I try to ask questions or you know learn from philosophers and think through it myself. What is this ultimate thing like? Sure. So, I mean, I'm happy to grant for the sake of the argument that there's an ultimate thing. I'm fine with that too. But I think that 
if I ask the question, what is the most, what is the field that gives us the most accurate answers that are most plausibly uh, answers about the fundamental nature of reality? I come to the conclusion physics. Physics gives us that, and philosophy does not. Philosophy does not seem to be a reliable source of information about the fundamental nature of reality. And so, if I'm going to try to make a conclusion about what the nature of fundamental reality is, I'd probably say we should follow the physics, not the philosophy. And okay. in regards to the philosophy, even if we granted philosophy, I don't think any of the arguments against an infinite regress are very good. Like, for example, the Grim Reaper paradox saying that, uh, what's his name? I forgot his name. Pruss. Something Pruss? Alexander. <laughs> Alexander Pruss. That's it. Thank you. Uh, so the Grim Reaper paradox seems to be no different from saying, uh, if we say 0 0.99999 repeating, well, which nine is the one that finally converts to a, to a zero and makes the chain into a one? Like, that's just a silly question. There's none of them. The, the, the infinite represents a complete set that ends in representing one. And so asking which reaper is the one that kills Bob at 11 a.m. The infinite isn't a number. There's not like you can't like subdivide it into particular parts and say this part is the infinite nine. Like, no. And so it seems to be the arguments against an infinite regress seem to be more misallocations of our uses of infinite as to represent individual sets versus or individual parts as opposed to a complete set like infinite is a complete set you're not allowed to say which which corner of the infinite is the one that touches the outside of the infinite um and so it seems to me the arguments against an infinite regress don't seem to amount to much even if we thought philosophy was going to to be able to tell us about these things and the arguments in physics seem to be extremely compelling like Space and time are emergent. We have very good reasons to believe this in quantum fields. Um, the math is very, very good and very predictive of things that we can see in reality. It tells us the future very, very well. And so if we want to say there is a spaceless, timeless thing, quantum field is the best candidate. Uh, do quantum fields have a beginning? No, doesn't, none of the math indicates that. This is plausibly a good explanation of uh, the origin of everything. Yeah, no, I respect that train of thought. Um... And I think it does kind of follow a little bit what I'm getting at. Um, you're, you're positing this ultimate thing as, a, would you say, what kind of field? Quantum field. A quantum field. So, like, you know, that um, that is the ultimate thing. It has no beginning. Um, and so I think, uh, similarly, a lot of thinkers have come to that conclusion that there is some ultimate thing that has no beginning. I mean, for a while, people thought it was the universe, right? So like Carl Sagan's uh, famous quote, what did he say? Um, the cosmos is all there is or all there was or all there ever will be. So I think um, a lot of folks are correct when they say there's got to be an ultimate thing, whether it's the universe, you, whether it's this field. Just to clarify, would you count that as uh, the ultimate thing? Because essentially um, it would have existed in the eternal past. It didn't like have a necessary beginning that necessarily exists outside of everything a quantum field could have just existed past eternally and so it would still be a past infinite uh i'm not 100 sure if i followed you there but i yeah i wouldn't say that uh quantum field is the ultimate thing i'm just saying it's a similar pattern of thinking that you've come to that they're they're it seems reasonable that there is an ultimate thing and you're describing this ultimate thing as a, as a quantum field, but maybe I'm misunderstanding you. Well, yeah. I just want to clarify that there's like sort of a difference in, in different models. One is where the quantum field exists throughout all past infinite time and it doesn't exist outside of time. And some say it exists outside of time. And so you can have these in both variations, but one of the ones where it's just a past infinite set of physical stuff essentially. Mm -hmm. And the quantum field is just in all of that. Um, that one I think wouldn't necessarily fit the typical theistic definition of a necessary thing because it is just past eternal, a past eternal thing more or less. Okay. And it's not outside of space time in that context. Okay. Yeah. I mean, a lot of theistic thinkers throughout history have wrestled with this idea too, that, you know, what is this ultimate thing, again, whatever you want to call it, whatever name you want to give it, this ultimate thing, what is its relationship to time? Is it outside of time? Is it part of time? I mean, some have posited that time itself is the ultimate thing, which I don't think is very reasonable. But yeah, I think that's a difficult thing to process and think through. Uh, I want to go back to what you said about philosophy and physics, though, because I, I would track with you. I think um, physics is extremely helpful in understanding uh, 
reality. I guess I don't have as much pessimism as you do about philosophy. I think philosophy can be helpful too. Um, so I don't see it as an either or. I think philosophers and physicists can work together to understand reality. In fact, one of my favorite uh, physicists is the guy I mentioned before, John uh, Polkinghorne. Uh, John Polkinghorne was a, a physicist a professor. I was looking for his book, uh, one of his books that I just um, have been reading. But John Polkinghorne was a, a physicist at Oxford uh, University, uh, but then he transitioned from uh, being a physicist to being a, a philosopher. And so John Polkinghorne has got, you know, very, uh, yeah, I find him to be a very rich resource because he's combining these two fields um, of philosophy and physics. I mean, he's a theist, he's a Christian. And so I find his his work to be fascinating. So I think philosophy and physics can work together. Another one that I give out to folks a lot, um, and let me preface this by saying that I don't, I'm not a professionally trained scientist. You know, my background is mathematics and and uh, philosophy. So um, the science can go over my head very quickly because that's that's just not my professional training. Although I do appreciate um, scientists and their work and try to learn from them as much as I can. So here's one that I, I recommend to folks a lot. It's uh, Stephen Barr, and he's a physics professor at the University of Delaware. I think I've had him on three or four times. Is that right? Okay, awesome. He's, I have he's met the him brother, in... the brother of uh, the bar who was a senator or big politician in America, right? Okay, I'm jealous. I haven't met him in person, but so um, you know, Barr is a, a professor of physics, and then this book is Modern Physics and Ancient Faith, and he lays out. Um, as he sees it, you know, how modern physics actually points to, as he sees it, the evidence um, points to a, a, an ultimate thing, a supreme being, if you will. And he goes through, you know, some of the more modern updated version of these um, arguments that have been around for thousands of years, first cause, design, and, and moral arguments. Sure, but my question would be is how? Like, I see the same arguments, and when I talk to experts, uh, on, on these arguments, they don't seem to explain why they think these are evidence. It's more just it can be explained by a god, more or less. But I mean, like it could be explained by magic leprechauns. I wouldn't call it evidence of magic leprechauns. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's yeah. I guess that's just life, isn't it? I mean, that's just life as finite creatures, where um, we're trying to understand based on the evidence as best as we can what is uh, true or what is real. And people come to different conclusions for various reasons. I did, you know, there's a lot of psychology behind that, I suppose. But um, well, those are what I'm interested in. What are those reasons? What are the reasons that um, cause people to use these particular arguments to come to the conclusion that it indicates a god? Because it seems like it's provably doesn't. It seems like you can just show it's a broken compass you can just like you can show that the ouija board doesn't actually indicative of spirits it seems like you can show these arguments aren't indicative of a god well certainly i mean and that's why i'm so impressed with the philosophy of religion community is because you have you know good thinkers who disagree on this issue and they are responding to one another's arguments and and trying to craft um trying to understand the issue so i mean the fact that people disagree um I don't think is indicative that all the theistic arguments have been proven um, wrong or silly or, or something to that effect. So I'm, I'm fairly convinced by these arguments. I find them to be, you know, very compelling that they're, first of all, you know, that there is an ultimate thing. And then you start, you know, using, because that's all the first cause arguments really get you, right? And a lot of Christians, that's why they don't like first cause arguments, because they're thinking, oh, I want an argument that's going to get me uh, the God of the Bible or something. But that's not really what the first cause um, family of arguments are attempting to do. So I'm talking about, you know, Kalam cosmological argument, Aristotle's unmoved mover, um, Leibniz's contingency, all of these are first cause arguments. There's got to be some ultimate thing. And then um, through other arguments or through just using abductive reasoning, 
um, to try to process what this ultimate thing would be like, that's how these various thinkers have come to this conclusion that this ultimate thing must be uh, intelligent because we see design in the universe. They, I think, reasonably conclude that this uh, ultimate thing is, is personal and moral because morality seems to be part of this reality that we exist in. So it seems reasonable that this ultimate thing is also the source of uh, morality. So I think that's how you know Aristotle and Plato and Gandhi and Eastern philosophers and Zoroastrian philosophers and you know all these philosophers around the world have come to similar, similar conclusions about this ultimate thing and why they posit um, it's a personal intelligent analogous to our minds but not exactly type of conclusion sure so the uh, design argument and the moral argument my position on the design argument is that i don't see design i see like if we call design the fine-tuning of the universe for example that if we change any of the physical constants even slightly uh, life from any universe won't exist well that doesn't seem to indicate that it was designed that seems to indicate that it just has a very low probability of having this outcome. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to say that the evidence for design is the fact that there's uh, a bunch of gray area where there's no life and one little red dot where there's life, essentially, that's like a dice with a bunch of gray sides, and one red side. Well then, and that is the design that needs to be explained. Well then this leads to the problem that who designed God? Cause a God would have mm -hmm. equally as many variations as the dice. Um, because for every pop potential kind of universe, there is a kind of God who could potentially want that universe. So there's a God who could want a universe of nothing but puppies or nothing but black holes or nothing but hydrogen atoms or nothing but unicorns. And so for each possible kind of way that the universe could be, there's a potential kind of God who could want that universe. And of these potential kinds of gods, there's only a very small amount who would want a life permitting universe. And so for the probability of this little red dot on this dice is the exact same probability for a God existing for wanting to create a life permitting universe. And so the same problem that is trying to be solved um, to explain why we have these particular set of constants would have the same probabilistic uh, effect of an argument against the God hypothesis. And so it doesn't seem to actually solve the problem. It just seems to kick it down the the road another step. And so it seems like if we answer it a different way, say it's just determined by physics or random chance by physics, you get a equally probabilistic outcome either way, either direction you go. One just happens to be slightly simpler because it doesn't entail a, a mind. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So uh, a couple thoughts in response. Um, I really have a, a, a very poor memory. I think that's why I went down the path of apology or um, mathematics and then philosophy because you can kind of map everything out and so my my skill set is problem solving and I have a, a horrible memory so I do terrible in things like history and and um, probably science too because it just ends up being a lot of facts that I have a hard time remembering but um, going back to what you initially said about um, seeing only design in there's two things I wanted to respond to but the first one was seeing only um part of the universe or a small part of the universe having design and i have thought about that right because if you look at our outer universe there does seem to be a lot of chaos um and one way that i've thought through it kind of as um an analogy is you know you come across or you go out to a forest right and it seems like um let's say one forest i go to call it forest a and everything seems to be completely um, chaos and random and weeds and trees and everything just growing haphazardly. And then you go into another forest um, and let's say 99% of that forest is the same way, right? It's completely chaos and random and trees and weeds and just seems to be no design whatsoever. But then you find, um, let's say in the center of forest B, a, a small uh, patch, which seems to have been groomed things planted in rows, maybe even a cabin that was built. And so even though there's it's only 1% of that forest, I think it would still be reasonable to conclude that there must be there must have been some sort of designer that was here in this forest to at least designed uh, this part of it. Then the other thing I wanted to respond Let's to clarify that that was 
I did not make that argument. Um, it's perfectly okay. fine. That's a common one. But my argument was specifically that if what you're calling fine tuned is this pattern of the 99% of chaos plus this 1% of order, mm -hmm. um, you see that exact same pattern when you look at the properties of God. So if you look at God himself, um, there's 99% possibility of randomness. Like God could want only a black holes or whatever, but he happens to have this one particular nature that leads to uh, a uh, this designed universe in such a way. And so my argument is more that if what you're calling design is that there's this 1% of uh, patternness and 99% of randomness, and, and the reason this is designed is because there's that 1% of randomness or whatever, or 1% of orderedness, the same pattern is found in God. So we would have to apply the same rationale to God and say, God must have a designer. And any response you make to that is going to have a parody argument where you just say, nope, nature just has its unnecessary being in this way or whatever, or it's determined by some fundamental nature. And so any way you answer this question is going to have an equal probabilistic answer from the conscious being hypothesis versus the natural hypothesis. Mm-hmm. Yep, I think I was tracking you. Um, so this idea of then what fine-tuned God, let's just boil it down to that, if I understood you right. Um, and I think it's similar to, you know, like when children ask, you know, or when children are taught, you know, God created everything, and then uh, the child asks, well, then what created God? And I think this, your design question or your design pushback argument, I'm not belittling it. I think it's a good thought process, but I think it's the same answer that, um, again, to avoid an infinite regress, which I think is reasonable to do. I don't, I don't think there can be an infinite regress. Um, you, uh, the only other option to that, as I see it, is that there's got to be an ultimate thing. So, well, who created God? Well, nobody created God because God's the the ultimate thing. And that, again, I won't use the term God. I'll use ultimate thing. Similarly, with this design, and, and theistic thinkers have, I mean, even going back to Aristotle, have struggled with this idea of then, okay, if theos, as he would use the term, is this ultimate thing, his unmoved mover, right? Um, he also struggled with this idea, well, then, you know, uh, design or God being complex, because that's usually how design is played out, specified complexity, right? There's, It's complex, there's multiple parts, and then there's specificity to it. They're, they're put in a specific order. So um, one of the ways that theistic thinkers have responded to what you're pushing back with is to posit that God is, is simple, right? So God doesn't have any uh, parts. He's a, he's a simple being. And this is, you know, Aristotle's conclusion. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm entirely on board with this idea of divine simplicity. I think it can result in some weird paradoxes that don't make any sense. But I think the initial, um, I think it's just more feasible to, just like um, with the cause question, there's got to be an ultimate uncaused cause that there also has to be an undesigned designer. Otherwise, you're going to have an infinite regress. So I think positing some ultimate thing at the beginning is more reasonable than uh, an infinite regress. Well, sure, but this seems to cause a problem for the fine-tuning argument because the fine-tuning argument seems to be that there is an object that has property X and property X is indicative of design. But the designer also has property X. But you don't need a designer for this one. So now it seems like the argument that this thing is fundamental isn't this property X, it's some other property, simplicity or whatever property you want to add in. And so now if you use a mathematical equation, essentially, and you can just remove all of the fine tuning from both sides of the equation, it no longer has any effect uh, on the conclusion whatsoever. So if you say that this property X is you know, of the universe is indicative of design, but God also has this property X, but it's not indicative of design um, and you need some other property, then you can completely omit this entire argument from the what would be considered uh, evidence whatsoever, because it, it doesn't in any way indicate design in both cases. You need some other property for it to be uh, non 
design indicative. And so really that other property is the only thing that matters. And this argument is just irrelevant. It does nothing. It seems like um, if you have that reply, then the fine tune argument is now completely worthless on its own. It's just, it's just irrelevant. Yeah, no, I don't find it irrelevant. Um, I think property X, you know, what you're getting at, um, you know, one of the responses to this, theistics, theistic thinkers have said, well, God doesn't have that property X then. So like Aristotle, he's, he's simple. He doesn't have specified complexity because he's a simple being. Um, others have just said, look, the, the, you can't kick the road down forever. There's got to be something ultimate, whether you, you know, call that the universe, let's say, Carl Sagan, or those who, you know, held to that, um, what's it called, that theory that the universe was the ultimate thing, right? They would just say, well, what caused the universe? Well, nothing caused the universe. What designed the universe? Well, nothing designed, because the universe is just the ultimate thing. There's nothing beyond that. Carl Sagan's you know, cosmos is, was, all that ever will be. It just is. And so I think it's a reasonable idea to say that there is something that just is, you know, either Carl Sagan saying that the universe is that ultimate thing that just is, or um, theistics, theists like Aristotle saying, no, the universe is that ultimate thing, is not that ultimate thing that just is. There's a, there's a different ultimate thing that just is, that doesn't have an explanation, that doesn't come from anywhere, that isn't moved. It's an unmoved mover. It's an undesigned designer. It is the ultimate thing. So I think... Um, as you said before, you know, either you have an ultimate thing or you've got uh, an infinite regress. And I just think it's more plausible that there that there is some sort of ultimate thing that wasn't caused, that wasn't designed, that in fact is the source of all those other things. Right, but I can just grant all of that. It doesn't really address the, the kind of thing I'm trying to argue for here. So if I say I'm a theist, I believe in God too. We can just grant, let's say God's, we're in a coffee shop in heaven, God's to the left, we both know God exists. And I want to say the argument you're proposing doesn't seem to logically indicate anything because it seems like you're saying there, here's a coffee cup and this coffee cup has property X and property X is indicative that something created it essentially. And the property here is that there's this large spectrum of ways the coffee cup could be, but it's only, it happens to have this one particular way that it is. Okay. So there's this, like a dice with a million gray sides, one red side, and the red side, it's on the red side. And said, this, this is the property we're really looking at. This is property X. And then I can say, I can look at God and say, well, you know, God has possible ways he could be too. God may only want a universe of puppies. God may only want a universe of black holes. And so just like the coffee cup has this large spectrum of gray dice, gray sides that don't result in life, life in the universe. God also has all these gray sides that wouldn't result in the life in the universe. And he has one red side, the exact same number of red sides as the, the universe we're looking at. And so this property X is actually in both of those things. Now you can add an additional thing and say, well, no, it's only that plus simplicity or plus the fact that it couldn't be otherwise, or plus the fact that there must be a, a final cause or, or first cause or whatever. But if you do that, then the original property doesn't matter anymore. It's like, well, okay, so this no longer makes a difference. We're not looking at the coffee. We're not looking at this property X, the fact that there's a bunch of gray size. That doesn't matter anymore. You could just skip to this other thing you've added and say, okay, so there must be this first cause thing. Um, the, the first property presented is just irrelevant. It just does nothing for the argument. It's completely innocuous to any kind of conclusion we're trying to make because you're granting that, uh, you need this other thing first before this, this, uh, this property X matters to anything we're talking about. Mm. Yeah. I'm not hundred percent sure if I'm tracking you. Um, so are you are you more discussing like the design argument or like a first cause family of arguments or or, or both because um it, your your analogy I'm, uh, if i understand it right is is you're starting with um uh, something in this physical realm a coffee cup or uh, maybe this universe is fine-tuned or whatever you want to say and then positing um a designer of this thing and i, I think that's a, a reasonable move i mean that that's just what design arguments are but 
I guess if I'm starting with, you know, a family of first cause arguments, whether it's contingency arguments, Leibniz or Aristotle's on move move or whatever, if I'm starting with this first, um, these first cause arguments, and I've already got an ultimate thing, right? I, I've, I've got uh, an ultimate thing that I'm starting with, a first cause, an, an unmoved mover. And then I'm asking questions about like, what is this, what is this ultimate thing like? Um, and then that's where I would make the move to uh, look at, like in your example, coffee cups or the universe or these contingent things and try to see, um, are these contingent things, do they seem to have any indication of, of design about them or not? And then from that, I'm, I'm, you know, positing attributes or positing characteristics of this ultimate thing. And, and as you're describing it, I think you're, you're right, or you're accurately describing what theists have come to is that there are some necessary things about this uh, ultimate thing. So like going back to Aristotle, right, he would talk about how this ultimate thing there are necessary aspects of this ultimate thing that couldn't be otherwise. And we would talk about that in our modern language about God's nature and the way that God is, he is necessarily so. Maybe that's kind of what you were getting at. Sort of. So I'm saying like the point of the design argument, because I'm focusing on the design one, not the cosmological one okay. here, is to say that there are a set of all objects and some objects have property X and the objects that have property X aren't the first cause thing that they don't have the first cause property they need they need some other explanation but if property x is in the explanation too and you need oh well it's okay in that sense because there's this other thing well then property x doesn't distinguish between the fundamental first cause and any non-fundamental first cause it's it's in all of them and so it doesn't actually help you to know whether or not something is the first cause and so if we're looking for something that gives us an inclination which is the first cause thing uh, the coffee cup or the God, and they both have property X. Well, property X tells us nothing. Like we don't need to look at property X. We need to look at a different property. And then you can say, well, oh, because there's this different property, property X is okay now. But in that case, now property X is irrelevant. We're not looking at property X. We're looking at this other property that makes property X okay to have. And so if you want to say property X is evidence, then you can't then say God also has property X, but it's okay because, because then X doesn't matter. We're not looking at property X anymore. We're looking at this other thing. And so if we, it seems like you take that approach with the fine tuning argument, well, then the fine tuning argument is just irrelevant. It's property X. Okay. Let's just, we can just ignore that. Let's look at this other thing because that's really what matters. Okay. Yeah. I think I'm tracking you. And I guess if I am tracking you correctly, I think what the theistic response has been to that line of thinking is that God is, God isn't like that. God doesn't have property X. We've only got two minutes left. Um, so I didn't know how you wanted to conclude this or, or end this, but I, I want to say that I've really enjoyed um, talking with you uh, today, Tom. I can see that you're a very thoughtful thinker and have really thought through and processed a lot of this stuff and have thought deeply about it. So I really enjoy talking to you about it. Thanks. Yeah. I appreciate you coming on. Um... The, the one thing I wanted to add was that this is like the most interesting part of the conversation where I really want to actually uh, drive down. It's, to me, it seems like when you say the universe has property X, but God doesn't have property X, it seems like the evidence that provided for the universe has property X is we can imagine it otherwise. We can imagine that there are changes in the gravitational constant that would result in alternative outcomes. But it seems like I can imagine there are different ways God could desire things. And therefore, it must also have this property. And so if you're adding in other things by calling it perfectly simple, well, that's that's a new topic. It, it's already met the same evidence of property X because the only evidence for property X is I can imagine it otherwise. Um, and then if you want to say it doesn't matter if you can imagine God otherwise because he can't be because it's necessary or whatever, that's the new property. Now, again, the X thing is gone and you've gone to this new thing and it's what matters. Mm. Yeah, I don't know if... If I would take that same sort of track, um, that I I know things could be otherwise because I can imagine them being so. I don't know if I would take that line of thinking, but I'd I'd have to think more about it. Cool. Well, thanks again. I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, would you like to give any links or references to where people can find your work? Yeah. So, like I said, my website is convincingproof.org, and uh, my next book is coming out this fall. It's called Divine Love Theory. What I specialize in 
is uh, meta ethics. And so this book, um, I'm positing a theory of meta ethics, a theory of where morality comes from. And I'm, my theory is based on the Trinity. So I think the loving relationships between the members of the Trinity is the best explanation of objective morality. I base my theory on Robert Adams. Um, he's probably the most well-known theistic thinker. He's been a, a philosophy professor at, at, at Duke and Yale and a lot of other folks. And John Hare, my theory is also based on John Hare's um, work at Yale too. But then um, I take my theory, my Trinitarian moral theory, and compare and contrast it with the leading um, atheistic theory of objective morality out there right now, Eric Wielenberg. And so half of my book is a critique of his theory and then a promotion, of course, of my theistic theory is a better explanation for objective morality. And Wielenberg has been great. You know, him and I have done a lot of stuff together. He wrote an endorsement for my book that'll go on the, the back cover. So that was really meaningful to me. And so, yeah, you can pre-order it on Amazon and Walmart, Target, wherever you buy your books. It's uh, called Divine Love Theory. Awesome. Thanks again for coming on. I really appreciate it. Let me know if you have any of those live debates. I'm happy to fly out to wherever to do those. Okay. And awesome. Yeah, I'll let you go. All right. Have a good one.